I'm going to show you all how I record my guitars. This was a topic that there was some interest around a while ago, and I never really got to it, but I'm going to do it now, and I'm going to show you all how I go about recording my guitars. So to start off, I'll show you how I set up my sound device audio interface. I use a Focusrite Scarlett uh, 4i4. I've been using the Scarlets for a while. When it comes to setting up your sound device or your audio interface, you know, other than installing the drivers, there's only really two key things you need to worry about, and that's your sample rate and buffer size. I have my sample rate set to this because this has become fairly standard throughout the music industry. The buffer size, usually I have at 512. I have mine set to 256 because I'm going to be monitoring my guitar through the software, not directly through my interface. If I were to monitor it through my interface, you wouldn't be able to hear it. So I'm going to be monitoring it directly through the software. Usually I wouldn't have a buffer size this small. The problem with that is this computer can handle it for the most part, but other computers that don't have, you know, they're not necessarily optimized for doing real-time audio you can run into clicks and pops once you start getting into these smaller sizes so for you who might be watching and trying to learn how to record guitars or trying to see how to record better i start at the biggest size and work my way down and see what's the smallest that i can get to without getting any or very little clicks and pops in my recordings because clicks and pops you don't want that if it's an occasional click or pop, you can fix it pretty easily, but when there's a bunch, that's when it's a problem. So, that's how I set up my audio device. So here we are in Mixcraft, my recording software of choice. I'm going to add a submix. And in this submix, I'm going to add three audio tracks. We'll call this, just call it Guitar One. And these tracks I'm going to label off of the inputs that I'm using. So I utilize the built-in cabinet simulator on my Orange Micro Dark Amp. I also have a second cabinet simulator that goes from my amp head into it and then into my uh, audio interface and then i just have a di so just a direct signal my plain guitar tone what's coming from this guitar directly into the audio interface that i have so i'm going to label these accordingly torpedo that's that um, external cab simulator that i have it's the orange cabinet simulator. DI is just going to be, yeah, the DI, a direct signal. So from here, we need to arm these tracks. So I have the, I have this coming from this channel. The orange is coming from input three. The GI is coming from input four. Now I'm going to drag this over here. You can kind of see. So we got SM57. That's input one. That's me talking right now. Torpedoes that one amp simulator. The orange is another. There's the DI. So I'm going to monitor so you can hear me now. Hear my playing. And before we start recording, we want to we want to get the gain levels appropriate. Now, I have mine usually set between minus 12 and minus 6. The torpedo and the orange kind of look like that right now. Um, the DI isn't. Usually the DI I would have in where this SM57 is. Uh, the DI is in an extra line input 
that I have on the interface. You, t you don't put your DI in a line input, you would put it in an instrument input, but for the sake of this video, I just have it there. Often it doesn't even matter because I don't use the DI to use a, you know, a lot of people they use the DI signal to add an amp sim to the guitars. I almost, I rarely do that unless I'm hiring a session musician. I'll almost never use the DI for an amp sim. It's usually for checking the timing on the guitar tracks that I have if I have to make any adjustments to it. Last resort would be an amp sim, but again, I really don't do that. Coffee break. Okay. So those levels look good to me. As long as you're right above 12, you're good. Everyone, everyone and their mother says something different. Some people say you should be peaking at minus six. Some say minus 12. I've heard minus 18. Between minus 12 and six is, you're good there, especially with distorted guitars. Like there's no random jumps or peaks going on. Although it is possible. That's why I keep it below minus six. Because I've had recordings where I think I've had it peaking or like everything was averaging at minus six. And then some, for one reason or another, the audio, the audio wave just like jumped up and clipped. I mean, you honestly couldn't even hear it. But again, I played a little bit safe. Your interface, modern day interfaces, preamps, they're not that noisy. You don't have to worry about getting it to the absolute loudest without it clipping. Between minus 12 and minus 6 peaking, that is good. Okay. So, uh, let me arm this one. Oh, that sounds weird. Okay, so we're just going to have the one engaged. Um, the direct monitoring with both of them going on doesn't sound right. It does sound cool. So I'm going to adjust the tempo to 140. And I'm going to record the next song that I'm working on. So, well, I'm going to record one of the riffs from the next song that I'm working on. So if you got the attention span to stick around, you're going to hear what I'm working on. So I've got a three bar count in, I believe, with the metronome. And then I'm going to start recording. Okay, so that's the opening riff. Let's play that back. I'm just going to trim this because why not? I'm going to mute the DI because we don't we don't need to hear that. All right, that's not terrible. Uh, I could probably do a little bit better. Let's check out this. So I'm going to use the DI to kind of see how in time everything is. I'm going to adjust the grid. As you can see. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. So all these little chops and the lines there, I'm adjusting based on how. It... So this is like a triplet riff. So I'm adjusting the grid so it's like lined up with triplets. This way I can see how accurate my timing is. It looks pretty good. Rushing a little bit there. Rushing a bit on this. As you can see, there, there's value besides just having this as a fail safe. That's how most people use the DI. They use it as a fail safe in case tones go bad when they're recording a real amp too. But you can really see the timing of your playing. It's pretty in the it's pretty early in the morning right now, and I'm not even warmed up, so it's a bit off. But I mean, it's not terrible. I'm gonna link these. 
This way, I'm going to make a cut like this. No, that was a record button. I have a gaming keyboard, and I didn't realize how sensitive the keys were. So, so I semi-regret getting one because, you know, I'm trying to hit Control, Control T to make a cut. Next thing you know, I'm hitting R, which is right next to it, barely, but since the keys are so sensitive. So we linked it. We made that cut together. That's why it's nice to have everything linked, and then you can move it around together. Yeah, something like that. That's kind of messy. Let me switch this up. That one's pretty good. Yeah, so this is kind of my long, painful process of recording. Um, coffee break. Usually, you go to a studio, the audio engineer would be doing this. But when you're one person, it becomes a bit time consuming and kind of tedious. But if you want the best results, you need to record multiple takes and stitch everything together. So let's see how this sounds. Uh, it's all right. So whenever you're stitching tracks together, you always want to make sure you do a crossfade. Because if you couldn't hear that, there's a click that goes on. And we don't want that. And we get rid of that by crossfading. Essentially, one track is going up in volume and the other is going down. And what that does, it creates a smooth edit. That's okay. Not perfect timing. This is a demonstration. I'm not. These aren't going to be the actual tracks for the song. Okay, I'm going to give this another go. Actually, let me check this one quick. That's actually pretty good. I'll keep that. So I'm going to give this another go with the recording. All right. Uh, that was all right. Nothing great. Uh, let's see if there's anything salvageable. That ending sounded pretty good. I could probably combine these two. We gotta link these first. I wish there was a shortcut for this. That one's okay too. Let's chop off that part because it's kind of messy. It's not an easy riff to play. It looks like it, but it's not. Trim this up. I don't want that. It sounds bad. Funny enough, I'm usually not this organized. But I'm working on it. For the sake of this video, I'm keep keeping everything organized. It's a habit I'm trying to break, but usually I'll just record a ton of takes because I'm kind of just in the moment kind of recording 
if the takes seemed pretty good and there's some salv salvageable stuff, I'll just leave it. If not, I'll just delete the entire take together. Problem with that is I'll end up with like four takes and then, and then I'm chopping them all up and then I'm listening for which ones sound good. It's too much work. So what I'm doing here is I'm kind of just chopping it up after each take instead of waiting to the end. And that seems to be better on my mental sanity. Yeah, that sounds really good, except that's rushed. Chop that. Chop that. I mean, that one sounds gonna rush too. Deleting it. Committing. I'm gonna keep this one. This is a demonstration. We're not looking for perfection. Uh, so we'll do this. So for the sake of time, I don't like doing this, but I will do it sometimes. I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna paste it over here. I did something wrong. Let me see. There we go. Good enough. Clean this up a bit. Let's add the crossfades. I'm just going to stick with these. Usually I will record way more tracks when I'm... When I am recording for real. But this is just a demonstration of how I do everything, so we're not looking for perfection. And even with these imperfect tracks, maybe that'll give me a chance to kind of show you how I do how I do time aligning, which I've sparsely used on guitar. Like very, 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 very little. So I'm just going to listen to it one more time altogether. Not bad. Not bad at all. So I'm going to disarm these. I'm going to kind of show you the beauty of recording with different uh, guitar cabinets, I guess we can say, I mean, they're cabinet simulators, but they're pretty much different cabinets. So what we have sounds pretty good. Um, I'm going to show you how they sound isolated. Here's this one. Sounds pretty good. It kind of lacks the high end attack that I like. That's where the orange comes in. But when you listen to it on its own, That's pretty nasty. Now, both of these I have used on their own in recordings in the past, but I've changed the EQ to make them work a little bit better on their own. With this, when I have them combined together, I have the EQ set so they work better together. I guess you can say that. And I like what I'm getting with this. It's very cool. And when they're combined together, if I really want like a harsh, aggressive sound, I'll I can turn down this one. Maybe even a bit more. Kind of sounds like an old school Ramstein kind of guitar tone. 
Or if I want the other, I want a fatter, warmer sound. Warmer, fatter, whatever. Everyone just mismatches these terms all the time. <laughs> I didn't even touch an EQ. I am just messing with these volumes. And then when I do get a kind of a blend that I like, I can then add an EQ on top of this entire thing. So I'll just pull it up. There we go. And then, you know, from here, I can adjust these parameters to whatever I want. That's extreme. I would never do that, but I'm just showing you what can be done. I'm going to get rid of that. And let's move on to the other guitar. I'm just going to duplicate this. Yeah, I'm going to duplicate, duplicate everything in it, but I'm going to delete all the recorded audio. These should be armed appropriately. I'm going to double check because why not? That looks good. That looks good. Yep. So they are armed the same. I'm going to mute that top one. I'm going to call this guitar two. And I'm going to go over here. Flick a switch. New guitar tone. I always have. Now, at least. This is more recent. I have one guitar tone in one ear and a different tone in the other. It's a nicer sound, bigger sound in my opinion. Something new I've been kind of doing. I don't know if everyone does it. When you use the same guitar tone, it's called big mono to some people, which whatever that means. It's not. It's still two different guitar tracks, but I guess it just doesn't sound as big. Okay, so I'm gonna take it from the top. I'm gonna do similar guitar part. It's not the same, but I'll show you. All right, let's see how that sounds. A little sloppy, a little sloppy. I check the timing. I mean, right here looks pretty good. Yeah. So that one might be good to use. Let's see how it sounds with the other one. It actually sounds pretty solid. I'm gonna mute the other guitar. How's this sound? Yeah, timing's off there. I'm gonna keep that though. Yeah, this is no good. Let's chop this. I don't like that one, actually. I like that one. Let's see. Mm, not so much. 
Let's see the timing on this one. Is that timing off? Yeah, that's a bit off. Not terrible. I just think this bottom one's a bit off. A bit more off. Maybe not. The struggle. This is my life. Okay, I gotta keep it for now. No, that just sounds sloppy. I gotta cut it. So I got this piece. If I need to replace that with the upcoming ones that I'm gonna record. So it's time to record again. All right, let's see what I got. This one sounds pretty good. Let's see. Dang it. I'm rushing. Let's see. I'm ahead of the beat. I'm just gonna scrap it. Again. All right, all right. All right, let's see how it sounds with this. That's pretty tight. This part sucks, though. So I'm going to cut that. Wait, I gotta link it. Oh, I'm not entirely sure if there's a way to, that it just automatically links them. So I gotta listen to that part still. I'm gonna cut this though, entirely. Let's trim this. Okay. Oh, let's do that again. Nope. Tricky when the lanes aren't all the same size. There we go. So that's wrong. Let's try this. Let's add that crossfade. See if that smooths it out. Oh, let's see how these two sound together. They're a little messy, but that's okay. These are not the final, the 
final tracks. Huh. Oh, okay, they are linked. What is this? Ah, uh, okay. I see. This one. Yeah, I messed up this part on pretty much all of them. Uh, the crossfade. No. Give these the crossfade. And if we want to be lazy, we could just loop this. This ain't the full recording. Okay, I mean, that's, that's the general recording process that I have. Again, like I was saying, um, I'm usually taking a bit more time and getting better tracks recorded. But from here, if I felt the need, this is where I can start kind of messing with the timing of the individual tracks. See how they're like a little bit off. If they're just a smidge off, I don't, I don't feel the need to really adjust them. The time aligning is really just kind of a last resort. So like maybe something like this. Do a little adjustment here. There, fixed. Um, I should probably explain um, how most people time align is they correct the timing and make it like spot on perfect. Whereas when I'm double tracking guitars, if I'm going to time align, this is a very new concept for me, I will time align the guitar that's the most off in timing to the guitar that is in more time. That way it doesn't sound, you don't get that off sound, but you also kind of preserve the playing and the groove, if that makes any sense. Hopefully it does. 
But usually I'm so stubborn that I'll just keep recording and recording and recording until they sound, sound lined up. But eventually, if it's a difficult song and you don't want to spend months practicing it and then recording it, I mean, time aligning it, that's like standard procedure anymore. So I don't think there's any shame if you're having difficulty playing something in time, just to time aligning it. Better than taking forever to release new songs. So that's one example. Uh, that was a little... Yeah, see what's going on here. Oof, it's pretty off. Uh, let's do this. This one's like pretty much behind. No, not snap off. Okay, let's try this again. All right, this top one's rushing. It looks like this one's more in time. Holy crap. Yeah, I can fix this. So I'll start off with an easy, easy edit, and I'm just going to shift it back. It already sounds better. Usually, if it was like that, I would... Like I was saying, I don't... I really don't time align unless I really have to. But it's good to know this skill. I don't want to actually don't want to time align it too much because then it'll sound off compared to the other ones. Okay, so let me make a cut here. Just nudge this back a little bit. Hit an extra note somewhere. I would definitely re-record it. But I'm gonna keep going. Somebody gets a bit big, bit ambitious here, so let me chop this. Let's see how this sounds. Further? Yeah, I guess that works. Put in the crossfades. I was doing this wrong. Let me undo this. Put 
push this back just a bit. So yeah, if I'm going to time a line, it's just going to be a little bit, just enough to make everything seem a bit tighter, because once you go down the rabbit hole of time aligning everything to the grid, you're also changing the sound. And there's nothing wrong with bands that do that. That's the sound they're going for. That's not the sound I'm personally going for. Um, a lot of my favorite bands either don't necessarily do that, or they've weaned off the highly editing aspects as they grew in fame. It just has a different sound to it. Especially, it sounds really good if the playing is tight too. So, that's kind of my thoughts on it. Although, personally, I think every independent artist, for the most part, should be doing it. Because, God forbid, your guitars don't sound, sound perfectly in time. There's going to be like a bunch of bloggers and playlisters denying you so from here i would mess with the eq on this but also in the end what i do is i hard pan these to the right and left and that's really where you get this nice big sound so i'm going to play this from the beginning if you're not using headphones or speakers if you're just on your phone you might not be able to tell the difference but this is how it sounds with the hard panning. And there's that. Also even sounds a bit tighter with them hard panned. It's also going to sound even tighter when you have all the instruments together. It's always going to have that weird chorus sound effect. If you know what a chorus pedal is, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It's always going to sound like there's a chorus when it's in mono. And as instruments are put in, and as you pan everything, that kind of goes away, and you get that nice full sound. Even with time-aligned guitars, it's just not as noticeable, but that chorus effect is still there. So that's the end of this. I hope you found it insightful. I hope I helped the, some of you out who are recording guitars or who are thinking about guitars. And let me know if you like this video because I like making them. I'll probably be doing more. And I'll see you next video. Whenever that is. Who knows.